before we begin, I really want to just encourage you, whatever is in your mind, whatever your worries are, whatever you left behind at home, the kids, undone chores, whatever, put those aside. This is a day when the Lord wants to speak to your heart and he needs an open heart. All he asks is that you look and turn towards him and be ready to receive all that he has to give you. My husband and I had the privilege about three years ago of going to Lourdes. My husband has advanced Parkinson's disease. He was stricken with it when he was 41 and we were expecting our sixth child. We went on to have a seventh. That's a story in itself. Um, but we were, we were grateful as his disease progressed that we were given the opportunity to go to Lourdes with the Knights of Malta. And as his caregiver, I was privileged to go along. And I remember in all the, the preparatory talks before we left for the journey, they emphasize to us that everyone who goes to Lourdes receives healing and that everyone is in need of healing. And so when I arrived there, I was struck immediately by this, that every person there was viewed with such love and esteem. How different from our society where our perfections seem to be limitations, our imperfections seem to be limitations. The things we struggle with, we suffer with, are things that we perceive that others will love us less because of. But in that environment, we knew everyone there was there because they were broken in some way. They were in need of healing in some way and that the Lord wanted to touch them. It was a tremendous gift of that spirit of love and sort of equality in our neediness. And that's what I offer to you today, that whatever our differences are, we are all broken in some way, needy before God, but we have a most generous God who will just bestow on you whatever it is that you need. And some of you who may know something about Lourdes will know that uh, there are baths there that you can go in that are freezing cold and that, that you go in and, and are draped immediately with a towel. And there have been miraculous healings from there. My husband did not get healed of Parkinson's, but we both came home healed of things that when we arrived, we didn't even know were in need of healing. And so again, I just offer to you, that is the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially working through his mother. And so today I am confident, I have been praying for all of you. And I know that God is going to work amazing things in your lives today, if we just open our hearts. So alive in Christ, Finding our true identity. What difference does identity make? Well, everything flows from who we are. If we know who we are, we know what our purpose in life is. And if we know who we are and we know what our purpose in life is, then we can make the good choices that will help us to, to arrive at that place. So what does this mean for us as Catholic women? As we wrestle with this question of identity, some of you are probably thinking, identity, that's all I hear about these days, right? Identity politics, everyone slicing and dicing a piece of our identity. And the risk is we lose that deeper sense of who we are. There are some things that are given in our lives that we know something about ourselves from the get-go. One of our children, when we moved into a new neighborhood, uh, was, she's a very friendly young woman now, but as a three-year-old, a four-year-old, she was one of those kids who would just speak to anyone and talk to anyone, and she was so proud of 
who she was and her family and the possibilities of life. So she would go up to every, every new person she would meet in that neighborhood. And she would say, I'm Bridget. I have, at that time, two brothers and one sister. We're Catholic, and we're a soccer family. And that, that was her identity. But she would always then stick up her foot and say, and I have new shoes. It didn't matter that those shoes, the longer we lived there, those shoes were getting pretty old. But to her, they were new shoes, and that was part of who she was. It was, it was as if she were saying, I'm special. I have new shoes. It's so easy sometimes when we're a child to sort of know who we are. It's a lot tougher when we go through adolescence and then young adulthood and all those phases of our lives. I remember when I became a new mom, I always felt like I, I'm a planner and my husband is not. It's one of those beautiful things about marriage. You improve each other by your, your polarities. And he has a phrase that I finally learned to appreciate. He used to say, when I'd be trying to plan something, he'd say, you just can't see there from here. That sometimes we can't see what has to be around the next turn and the next turn and the next turn. All we can do is make the best decision for where we are today. But in, in asking ourselves who we are, the culture has an answer for us. And we're all shaped by it. Whether we think we are or not, we're all shaped by what the culture tells us is our identity as a woman. And so the culture tells us what? That our worth is measured by the money we make, how beautiful we are, how perfect our lives appear, whether we're sexy, whether we're powerful. These are the messages our culture gives us. And like everything, there's a bit of truth we need to, we want to be in good health. It's good to be able to do things and to accomplish things. But these are not the source of our identity. And yet this is what the culture would have us aspire to. But we need to aspire to something greater. Instead of seeing ourselves in the culture, we need to look elsewhere for that understanding of who we are. The culture also slaps labels on us, right? Slices and dices us so that we stop thinking of ourselves in our most fundamental identity, not just as a woman, but as a Catholic woman. Instead, we put all those labels on. So my challenge to you here this morning is take those labels off. Unstick them from your sense of who you are. And labels are sticky things. We don't like to tear them off, and, and they're hard. They leave a residue. But I challenge you here today to put aside those labels that sometimes come from others, sometimes we put them on ourselves, and to open your heart to see who you are in a deeper way. We are challenged often in our culture by people like Oprah to be our best selves. But that conception of our best selves is often built around the things we do rather than who we are. And unfortunately, as women, we tend to compare ourselves to others. Walking into this beautiful place with so many beautiful women, I'm sure for many of us, the tendency is to look at what someone's wearing and think, gosh, I wish I were that stylish, or I wish I had those shoes, or I wish I had that haircut. We compare, it's just something that we women do, but it's reinforced by the culture and it can be very destructive. In fact, there are, now there's a lot of social science that's being done around the impact of social media. And one of the things they've found, for women in particular, girls, but also for women, that the more time you spend on social media looking at images of thin women, doesn't matter if you're already thin, but if you're looking at images of thin women, the more dissatisfied you are with yourself. And in the same way, the more you spend looking at the really imaginary lives of others, the illusory lives of others, where everyone is, has the perfect weekend and the perfect family and just is, is always doing these amazing, great things, the more we immerse ourselves 
in others <clears throat> online images, that self that people put in front of others, the more discontented we become with ourselves and with our own lives. Instead of turning and realizing the beauty that we have inside, the gifts that God has given in our lives. We're so busy doing the swivel. You know, it used to be swivel in real life, looking at, at everyone else, and now it's just the click, the click, the click. Looking at what others appear to have, and it creates a yearning in our hearts for something that is not ours. We miss the chance to step back and to say, Lord, who am I in your eyes? Who am I in your plan? And what is it that you would have me do or change in my life? And this brings us back to the whole question of purpose. You know, I do a lot of traveling, so I spend a lot of time in airports. And in airports, they have those um, moving sidewalks. Right, you, you get on them and they just, they just take you somewhere. And in some airports, those moving sidewalks can be very long. They, they usually are punctuated by about a 10 yard um, segment where you have to walk and then you get on the next moving sidewalk. You could walk for miles. And in fact, I've had the sort of disorienting experience of being on that moving sidewalk and then thinking, where am I going? What's, what's my gate? You know, what, what airport am I in? Sometimes our lives are like that. Right, we get on the moving sidewalk, the trajectory of the things we have to do every day. And we begin to think everything in front of us is necessary. Instead of saying, what is my purpose? What did God put me here for? And are my decisions and the things that I'm doing in life aligned with that greater purpose? I oftentimes speak to young women who are wrestling with how to balance marriage and family life with their work and their careers. And the thing that I say to them is to remember the only place that you are irreplaceable is in your relationships. No one can be your child's mom. No one can be your husband's wife, your mother and father's daughter, the friend to your best friend, the only place you are irreplaceable is in your relationships. I always tell people, if you got hit by a bus today and were laid up in the hospital for two years, your employer would find someone to replace you. Those volunteer committees that can't do without you would find someone to replace you. But your children, your husband, your best friends would be there with you because you are irreplaceable in their relationships. That is how God views us. His relationship with you is irreplaceable. It's not, it's not good enough for God to have a relationship with everyone else but you. He calls you because he loves you. And only you can respond to him to receive what he has to give you. So to make sense of our lives, we need to first realize our first purpose, we've been created by God, we're going home to God. We need to love God more. We need to ask him that question, what do you want me to do with my life? And that's not a, quest a question we ask once. You know, when I was growing up, everyone talked about, you make your vocation decision. Are you called to the religious life as women? Or are you called to marriage? And that was it. That, that was sort of the question you would ask of God. And then maybe you'd ask a question, should I go to grad school? Should I take this job or, or whatever? And then again, maybe about getting married. Well, you should about getting married, I hope, right? But we tend to think that God doesn't care about the many decisions we make in our day. And God cares very deeply. He wants you to ask, why? because he cares for you and he wants to help guide you so that you can flourish so that when you encounter the burdens and the obstacles that are in your life that are unique to your life he can give you the strength that you need in order to ride those rough waves 
So Catholic women, we aspire to something deeper, to something greater. And we have a vision for that. We have the great saints. A few days ago, we celebrated Saints Perpetua and Felicity, which if you haven't read those stories, please go back and read them. It's tremendously powerful, these women who were persecuted and killed for their faith. One had her child with her in prison. Imagine, imagine what she struggled with. Just humanly speaking, wouldn't you be tempted to say, I'll say anything, I can't be parted from my, my infant, I have to care for my infant. But she trusted God. She knew that God loved her child more than she did. And she trusted him. And I had a similar circumstance in my own life. Um, before my husband was diagnosed with Parkinson's, when I was expecting our sixth child, early in the pregnancy, I had several seizures unexpectedly. And that set off a round of tests and they discovered I have MS, multiple sclerosis. And so my husband and I, first of all, that was our first uh, realization that you know what, sometimes things don't work as you planned. And that we needed to be open to whatever God had in our lives. But for me, the challenge in trusting God was this. Because of the kind of seizures that I had, I had to take a certain medication because the doctor said, we can't have you going into a seizure where you're gonna be unable to breathe. Your unborn child will die. They said, you must take this medicine. But that medicine, and I'm, I'm a lawyer by background, so I read all the labels, and of course the doctors tell you the side effects. It had, a, you know, not a huge risk of side effects, about 20% but enough and serious side effects that I wrestled every time for about the first almost month that I was on that medication. Literally every night I'd be just wrestling with God, crying as I would have to take this medicine because I knew I needed to do that. And yet I knew that by taking that medication there was a risk I was damaging my child. And yet I knew that the risk could be greater if I didn't. And it was, it was tremendously difficult. All I could think of was, God, why do you have me in this situation? How can it be that my only choices are things that can harm my child? And yet what I discovered in those tearful nights of literally wrestling before God was that God loved my son even more than I did. And that the God who loved me and who loved my son could be trusted to do what was good, to take care of me, our family, our son. And that I needed to know God's love enough to trust him with that outcome that I could not see and that outcome that I didn't want. And so it was God who changed my heart, who made me realize his love is enough. Because whatever we go through, his love will get us through that. Nobody can love the people we love more than God. And so I'm sure in this audience today, there are women who are wrestling and struggling with someone in your family, a good friend, a sibling, a parent, about whom you are tremendously concerned, you're worried, and you fear for them. You don't know what's going to happen in their lives. And you feel a tremendous weight of responsibility and anxiety and worry. And so to you I say, wrestle with God, but reach out and grab his hand because he is there and he loves them more than you do. And that is enough. That is enough, he will give you that. So we have in our Catholic faith the example of saints, but we have also ordinary women. And in the letter to women, John Paul II spoke in particular about the witness of women who in their ordinary lives give of themselves 
to others. And that we needed to look to those women for examples of how to be in our own lives. You may recognize some of the faces here. The woman with the two children is Asia Bibi. She was the Pakistani woman who was imprisoned and threatened with to be killed for blaspheming the Quran or Islam. And she was held for years. Again, like Saints Perpetua and Felicity, the temptation to say, I'll pretend I'm no longer a Christian. I'll retract my beliefs in order to be there for my children. That temptation must have been tremendous. But she held firm, and the court finally said no, she would not be put to death. There are others, the sister in the, in the blue headscarf works with trafficking victims and, and women of all sorts in different African countries. And she spoke to our bishops and the cardinals of the world during the sexual abuse summit and spoke to them as a mother because we're all mothers. We're all mothers in some way or another and challenged them to love the children in their care even more. And then, of course, we have volunteers and we have the sisters in our own lives. We have our mothers, our friends, the ordinary women in our lives. You know who they are. They may be here with you today. They are the ones you can look to and find the encouragement. Not to compare and say, oh, I'm, I wish I were like that, but to say, will you pray for me? To notice when they need something to give and have it be a, a mutual, reciprocal giving. So what do we need to know about ourselves? If we take off all those labels that the world puts on us, who are we at our core? First thing we need to know is we are creatures. That means we were created by God in relationship with him. Now, you know what that means? That means there was never a time in your life when you were truly alone or unloved. Because from the very first instant of your life, you were in relationship with a God who loves you tremendously. And that we are never truly alone. And we forget that. We feel like God's not there. And sometimes it's because we turn our backs. Sometimes it's because we do this. Sometimes it's because He's quiet, and we're not experiencing his presence. But I can tell you, we would not be here if the God who created you didn't love you still to this moment with a depth that you cannot imagine. So that's the first thing. Realize how loved you are, and that you have always been loved and never truly been alone, in spite of the human loneliness that we may experience. We're made in the image and likeness of God. That gives us our fundamental equality, our fundamental dignity. So that earlier slide with you know, the women looking wonderful and the power and all this stuff, our culture tells us that we sort of earn our dignity or that our dignity must be validated by others. That we really don't have it unless it's in a law, unless it's, um, we feel like we're being treated with dignity. Of course, we should be treated with dignity. The law should protect our dignity and the dignity of all. But the fundamental truth about who we are is that we have dignity that nobody can take away because our dignity is rooted not in our attributes or what we do. It's rooted in the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of God, that he loves us. That's the source of our dignity, and nobody can take that away. Mulieris Dignitatum was an encyclical written by Pope John Paul II, and I won't go through everything here, but if you, have not, if you have not had the occasion to read that, I encourage you to read and reflect the dignity and vocation of women. Our church has much to say about that. But what I want to talk to you here right now is to show you the face of dignity, to challenge that notion 
that dignity is something that comes from outside, that depends on how others treat you. So this, I had the privilege of meeting this young woman, Melly, about a year ago at the United Nations. She was testifying about sexual trafficking. I didn't know that when I first met her. I first met her and I was just struck by her peace, her simplicity, her kindness, just her genuine spirit of, of goodness. And then it was only when I started to talk to her and then later heard her, her story and her testimony that I realized what a tremendous witness to the dignity of women she is. Her life was not easy. She was born in the Philippines. Her father passed away. Her mother remarried. At the age of eight, she came upon her stepfather raping her sister. And she told her mother, and her mother, who was desperate to keep this new spouse, put Melly in an orphanage and never visited her. And she said that was one of the things that she had to come to terms with and to forgive her mother, even before everything else that happened. Just that sense of being rejected by her own mother. It was one thing if you were put in an orphanage because your, your mom couldn't care. She said she could have dealt with that. But for her mother never to visit, she felt like she was worth nothing. She went in the orphanage. She um, was being taught and educated. And she used to daydream with some of her friends that there would be a better life out there somewhere. And when she was in her mid-teens, early teens, she and a, a friend were hanging out in a place that, that uh, teenagers clustered. And they'd been talking again about how they wanted a better life and maybe to go to one of the other islands. And this well-dressed, elegant woman came up and said, I heard you talking. I can help you. I can give you a job and you can keep going to school. I'll pay your passage. Come with me. So they trusted this beautiful, elegant woman. And they went with her and they traveled to this other island and were brought into a city and they were taken directly to a brothel. So here she was. She said she begged and she cried and she pleaded with that, that woman to let her go. And the woman said no. And so for the first three days in that brothel, she would have nothing to do with those customers. They would not feed her until she would comply. And her life for the next almost decade was one of being mistreated, brutalized, treated like a piece of meat. She was, the brothel owners would give them drugs every day before the customers would come. Initially, she said she didn't want to do that, and then she started doing that because it helped to dull the pain of what she was experiencing. And then after a while, they get you kind of hooked on that, and, and your whole life feels out of control. And she said the hardest thing was that she had no hope. She had no hope that things could get better. And she and another girl, the longer they were there, they were given a little trust. They could go to the market and things like that. Because by then, she thought so little of herself. She wasn't going to run away because she thought no one would have her. She had no place to go. But it was on one of these excursions to the market that a brother, a Catholic brother, came up to her and just said something kind, which she was struck by. People weren't usually kind to her. And over time, he and another sister began to make friends with her, to give her food, to be kind, to let her know that when she was ready, if she wanted another life, there was a place to go. And they started to talk to her about the good that they saw in her, and that her life could be different, and that they were there to help. And she said for, for months and months, she couldn't believe them. Why? Because her heart was so closed, she didn't want to trust. She couldn't trust. 
but gradually the love and the kindness and the consistency opened and she said one day it was as if someone switched the light on. All of a sudden she had hope. She thought, maybe it can be better. Maybe it can. And by then she knew who she could go to. And so she went to these, the, the brother and they took her away to a home. It was run by, I think it was Sisters of the Good Shepherd. I could be getting that wrong. Um, but she was there for three, four years as they loved her, healed her, helped her recover that sense of who she was, who she is, and taught her skills and continued her education. And Melly, during that time, learned to forgive, which I can only imagine the difficulty of that. She'd been wounded by so many. But what she discovered was that her dignity had not been taken away. That the God who loved her, and even though all this evil was visited upon her, that evil was not from God. But that God had sent people to help get her out of that, to help restore her. And so she just, she blossomed. And as she gained her strength, she gained a clarity of purpose as well. She decided that she, while she was, um, pursuing education to, to be a med tech, she wanted to go back to that same city. She wanted to go back to that same market and to find the young women who she knew came after her. And so that's what she does. She goes back and is one of those people reaching out to other young women like her to tell them, you have dignity, you're worth so much. There's something better, and we can help when you're ready. We can help. And so I was so, so moved by her story because, as I said, when I first met her, I knew nothing about her. All I saw was this beautiful, kind, peaceful, gentle young woman with a sense of dignity. And yet she'd been through all that. She fought hard to recover that sense of dignity. But that dignity came from people who loved her and who brought her the love of God. And that's what she says at the end of her testimony. She says, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. God can do so much in our lives if we understand our dignity. No matter what mistakes we've made, no matter how we've been treated, God has something better. God has something better. Open our hearts to listen to him. What else do we need to know as Catholic women? We're equal to men, but we're different. Can we say that our culture is having a hard time understanding that, you think? And it, it's unfortunately, some of this goes back to the early days of feminism, and feminism was needed, okay? There were many injustices in our culture. Women needed to have opportunities. And I'll give you a, a small little example, a trivial example. When I was in high school, I, uh, I'm one of 10, the second of 10 kids. And so we all had summer jobs and, and uh, you know, did what we could to earn money towards college and things. And I was very frustrated as when I was a 17 year old because at that time, the want ads in the newspaper were still split, women and men. And I looked at the women's jobs, which I was a teenager. It wasn't like I was gonna get hired for, you know, it was entry level. But I looked at the women's jobs and they were paying a lot lower than truck drivers. And I, because we, were, um, we had a big family, I took my driving test on one of those big vans. So I thought, I can drive a big truck. But that was a man's job. I couldn't even apply. Now, of course, my parents were saying, you don't want to do that. They would never have let me because it was, there were a lot of safety concerns. But I remember thinking at that time, well, that's ridiculous. I can drive a truck as well as any guy. You know, so there were things in the law. Women couldn't have their own bank accounts. If, all those sorts of things. They needed to change. Women needed the opportunities. As John Paul II said, and Pope Francis has said, and Pope Benedict, we, we need women's gifts in the workplace. We need women's gifts everywhere in the culture. So it was good that, that their society needed to open up. But the problem was this. In recognizing the problem, 
the wrong solution was proposed, that if men get to do something, then that became the standard. We need to be like men. And if you think about it, it's sort of a position of inferiority to say that the way men do it is therefore the best way, instead of saying, make room for us as women. I'm a woman. I bring value to society, to the culture. Don't turn me into a man. Don't tell me that in order to succeed, my life must look like a man's. Make room for me as a woman. Recognizing that we're equal in dignity, but we're different, which means we bring different things to the table, and that's a good thing. But some of that has been lost in society, in our culture. And so we've been told that it's empowering to leave behind and to reject motherhood and children, that our life and the fulfillment of our life is measured more in dollars and cents or by our career achievements. You know, and, and over the past five years or so, well, seven years, I've had the privilege of being at the bedside of my parents and my in-laws and other elderly relatives as they passed away. And I can tell you, when people die, it doesn't bring them comfort to put their resume next to the pillow. What brings them comfort, or to look at their bank balance, what brings them comfort is to look into the eyes of a loved one. We women have a gift. We prioritize others. We need to recognize that what we bring is what society needs, what the culture needs. Men and women are not identical, and that's a good thing. Let's be proud of that. Let's celebrate that we are women. So at a related point here, we're in a culture where women are objectified. And I know we've been saying that for decades, so why isn't it getting better? The pornography culture is worse than it has ever been. A little less than a year ago, I hosted a, um, a conference on the sexual revolution. And looking at the consequences of the, of the sexual revolution for women, women have borne the brunt of the sexual revolution. The wounds are in our bodies. The abortions that women have had, the effects of contraception, the STDs, women's bodies are more vulnerable to ST, sexually transmitted infections. Women's hearts are broken. Women suffer more from depression when a relationship ends. We're not made for serial sexual relationships. And yet that is what the culture held out to us because there was a double standard where people looked the other way when men did that. The answer should have been to hold men to a higher standard, not to come down to that standard. But instead, our culture has gone so that the only gatekeeping mechanism, as we saw with the Me Too movement, is this idea of consent. Well, let me tell you, if someone is exploiting you, just because you consent, it's still exploitation. So you cannot consent to your own exploitation. So when someone is using you, yes, the law says consent and fine, it's not a crime. You're still exploited. And so women have the right to be treated with dignity, never to be used as a thing. And that's what happens with our bodies. Our bodies are commercialized. They're commercialized now in the process of surrogacy. In the state of Virginia, we just um, were on our way to passing a law that would allow couples to come in and basically rent a woman. They can bring their own embryo from another state. So we've commodified children and turned women into breeders, incubators. It's another way of objectifying our bodies because we're not appreciating the beautiful dignity of women. And in the same way, this picture here on the bottom, there's a trend, I don't know if you've noticed it, as the transgender movement has gained steam, every major fashion house, makeup house, women's magazine, is using transgender models. 
to sell women makeup, clothes, hair products. I don't know about you, but I find that kind of offensive. Why isn't it good enough for a woman to model makeup and model clothes? And how is it that a man who says he feels like a woman, how does he even know what it feels like to be a woman? Just kind of want to ask that question. So. so in all these ways, women's bodies are still objectified. And that's where the church's teaching comes in so beautifully. We are a union of body and soul. And we have dignity and we are never, never to be treated as an object. And that was one of the beautiful, really profound points of John Paul II's um, theology of the body, that we are made for love. And as human beings made for love, we can't be treated as something disposable. And Pope Francis writes eloquently about that in, in Laudato Si and in Amoris Laetitia, that we're not disposable, we're not things to be used. We're persons to be loved and cherished. Amen. What about sin? Some of you may be thinking, OK, that all sounds good, but that's not my life. Here's the reality. We sin. Jesus was perfect. Mary was spared from original sin. The rest of us are sinners. And sin enters into our relationships. And so when we experience someone not respecting our dignity, when we experience someone who denies our equality of dignity, when we experience someone who ridicules us, who uses us, that's sin talking. That's not God's plan. And so we have to name sin. And as women, we need to name the sins against us. When women are used, when women are exploited, that is a sin. And we need to speak up about that. But we need, too, to recognize in our own relationships, we bring sin into relationships. So in any relationship between men and women, you are going to have this, this difficulty because we're both sinners. And so it means that when your life is, is um, not what you want it to be, when you can see that there's evil in some way or an injustice towards you, what should you do? The church would never say you should stay in a dangerous, abusive, or unjust situation because you have a right to your dignity and to have that be respected. But the church would also say, does say, that we have an obligation to look at ourselves and to say, where am I failing? Am I allowing selfishness to enter into this relationship? Am I allowing possessiveness, my own self-focus, to crowd out love and openness or forgiveness. And forgiveness is one of the things that we women sometimes struggle with. I think, um, well, I think it's something that it's easy to hold on to. Sometimes we women are long suffering, but long sufferingness can turn into resentment. And resentment can become a poison. And as someone once said to me, you know, when you, when you plot revenge against someone, it's like drinking a poison and hoping it will kill the other person. It's going to kill you. And so holding on to resentment and anger is something that poisons us and it poisons relationships. And I want to give you a, tell you another little story about um, a woman. I'll call her Clara. And I call her a feisty grandmother because that's what she is now. I, th I have a, a feeling she was a feisty person all the way along in her life. And I met her th uh, through work in the diocese. And she's one of these people who's, who's happy, who's outgoing, who's energetic, who accomplishes so much. And it's easy to think when you meet a person like that, that, wow, she's had a great life. It must have been easy. Her life has not been easy. It took a long time for me to learn her backstory because she's so focused on giving to others and doesn't like attention drawn to herself. It's only in friendship 
that you learn certain things. And I learned that when she was a young mom, her husband had an affair, and he left. And he left her with five children. And she was a very capable woman, and so she said, all right, Lord, this is where I am. So she went out, she provided for her kids, educated her kids, had sporadic um, relationship, you know, conversations and dealings with her husband, obviously, in dealing with the kids. But they were not close, as you can imagine. Well, over time, she learned through her children as they became adults, and there was less occasion for her to be in touch with her former husband. Um, she learned that her husband had developed a debilitating disease and that he was struggling. And then she learned a little while later that his lover took off and that he was alone. And then she learned a little while later that he was really struggling. And then one day she got a phone call and it was her husband. And he said, I want to come home. That's, that's, that is a tough phone call to receive. And, and in telling this, there's more to the story. In telling this, I want to emphasize, not everyone could do what she did or should do what she did. She said yes. She brought him home. She renovated her house so that it was handicap friendly. And she cared for him and nurtured him till the end of his life. But here's the real thing. How did she get to that place? She felt angry and abandoned and deserted when her husband left, rightfully so. But she chose in the intervening years from when he left to when he asked to come home she chose not to stew in her resentment, to deal with those feelings, to acknowledge she'd been wronged, to acknowledge that loss, to grieve that loss, and then to move to forgiveness. And then over the years, one of the things that happens when you get depressed or your life is difficult is you can become self-absorbed. She chose in those years, especially after her children left home and she had more time, she chose to make herself a person for others, a person who gave continually to others. And so what God did with her through that process is he stretched her heart, he opened her heart, he changed her heart, he moved her heart with tremendous compassion so that when that call came, her husband was not calling the same woman he left. He was calling a woman deeply in love with the Lord, with a strong prayer life, who had learned to forgive, who had seen the struggles of others, and had decided to do what she could to help others. So that when that call came, her heart had grown so that she could say yes. And again, not everyone should say yes. She didn't have an abusive spouse or whatever. She knew that was what God wanted her to do. But it was the years preceding it that prepared her to be able to say yes. And in saying yes, she was saying yes to God. She knew for her that was what God was asking. So our theme today, alive in Christ, what does that mean? It means like Clara. It means like Melly, that God has a mission for us that we need to embrace who we are as Catholic women, to know our dignity, to know that we are loved, no matter what circumstances are in our lives. And then to say, Lord, I'm here. Show me what it is that you would have me do. Let me serve, let me love, realizing that in doing, in giving of ourselves, we're not emptying and becoming depleted. God's going to fill us up. God wants us to take care of ourselves. Let me be, be clear about that. Women sometimes can give and give and, and 
forget to take care of the very person that God, God loves you. He wants you to take care of you too. But he wants us to give, to open ourselves, to see those who, who he's put right in front of us who need our help. And so the last story I want to leave you with is a woman named Dolly. And she was a woman who lived um, close to the campus of Notre Dame, where I went to school. And when her kids were grown and her husband had died, she was thinking, what can I do? And through a, a variety of circumstances, someone asked if a single mom and her son could stay with her. And she said yes. And from that grew this ministry she could never have imagined of just seeking out, finding those who needed a warm, loving place to stay. And her house became known as Dolly's house. And there were people year after year who came in, felt her love, got on their feet, and were able to go back out into the world. Dolly's life, if you looked at her, her qualifications, were nothing that we, you know, would be impressive on a resume. It didn't matter. She saw a need, she had love in her heart, and she said, Lord, what can I do? And then she looked around and she answered the specific call that was in front of her. And that's what she says. She says, it's not as complicated as you think. You don't need a grand plan. Sometimes you need to just look and see what's in front of you. Lord, how do you want me to serve? Where should I love? How can I love better? Look and see what is in front of you, because that is what God wants. So for us, Catholic women, let's celebrate being women. It's good to be a woman. Yes. And it's good to be a Catholic woman. You know, I, I work with um, women all over the country, and I deal with the media uh, on a, a fair amount. And it seems like whenever they want to talk to a woman, they want to find a woman who's going to complain, who's not happy being Catholic. And, you know, I, there was one panel I was on once. It was, is Christianity bad for women? It's like, who titles a panel that way? They had a full house, you know, people, people wanted to hear that topic. But so here's the thing I challenge you with, and I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. You know, be happy to be a woman, be proud to be a Catholic woman. And then embrace all that that means. We have the gift of a church, our mother, that will guide us. The teachings of the church are meant to help us live and flourish as women. That's all. That's what they're about. Because the church knows, God knows what our purpose in life is. And that's to have eternal life with God. The God who's loved us from that first instant until the day we come home. And so the church is there to help us find our way. So love the church in spite of the failings of leadership, of all the sinners, all of us who are in it. See the beauty of the church. Embrace the sacraments. And I hope here today, if you have a chance to go to confession, um, to just really soak up what God has to give you. God loves you. I thank you for being here. I'm so, so thrilled to see so many wonderful women. It's great to be a Catholic woman. God bless you. <laughs>